Today we are talking with Dominic Levin, uh, the author of The End of SARS Russia, The March to World War I and Revolution. Welcome to Ridera. Thank you very much. It is a very interesting book and uh, it is a very well researched book. Give us a little bit of audience, a little bit of overview in why you focused on this topic and what attracted you to focus and write on the the end of the uh, Tsarist Russia and, and the revolution that led to Well, I mean, you know, you could s attack that question from a lot of different angles. But most basically, the First World War was hugely important. In many ways, was the beginning of... Uh, all the other extremely disastrous uh, uh, events which hit Russia in the 20th century, vastly important for the world, introduced the 20th century in many ways with its, um, you know, le leading directly not just to the Russian Revolution, um, but on to international instability between the wars and the Second World War, endless consequences. And of course, still very relevant because uh, the fundamentals which led to the catastrophe of 1914 and the destruction, if you like, of the era of European domination of the world and of European civilization of the 19th century still exist in the contemporary world. You know, I live in Tokyo half my life simply because my wife is Japanese and runs her own company here. You can see very many of the same basic fundamental process is working out in East Asia now, and it's by no means to be uh, taken for granted that we won't see the similar catastrophe in the, you know, the last 50 or 60 years of very rapid economic growth in Asia, this time with truly catastrophic consequences for the whole world. So, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons, both historical, uh, Russian, more general, and contemporary. Uh, to look very hard indeed at the origins of the First World War. Uh, and the reasons for doing that from the Russian perspective are partly because Russia was absolutely fundamental to the, you know, the, the origins of the war, partly because the war had truly catastrophic uh, consequences for Russia, and partly because although the Russian end is enormously important, it's the one which is least understood in the outside world, partly because the archives have been closed for so long. So if I was going to give, uh, you know, the most fundamental reasons for having a go at this topic, I think those would be them. <laughs> Europe was at the center of the world at that time and continued for a long time until we had the rising powers, of course, in America and in the U.S. and the uh, Asia as well now. What was the uh, kind of brewing scenario or what was the geopolitical situation at that time between the two leading powers I would call Germany and Russia and and I think you do go into a little bit in the details in the book of the land and territory and but if you would give us a little bit of overview that why were the two powers were struggling to compete for influence what was driving them sure uh, well I mean look yes the basic point is still that uh, Europe dominates the world at that point um, but if you're really digging beneath the surface, um, an awful lot of the growing international crisis actually has to do with the rise of the United States. The truth of the matter is that the United States was potentially becoming so powerful that anybody who ran a, a European great power knew that if they were going to be a truly great power in the future, able to compete with the United States, they needed continental scale continental scale and resources and the only way that a european power could do that was empire that is the basic logic of the age of so-called high imperialism that unless you acquired huge territories and resources which for a european country could only be done through empire you were fundamentally going to be second rate in the 20th century and if you are looking most fundamentally at the struggle between germany and russia it is that the russians are confident that in the long run they can, and perhaps only they can in Europe, match the United States. Whereas the Germans know that although that at present um, they are the leading, the most powerful country in Europe, within a generation or two, they're going to be completely outmatched for certain by the United States and probably by Russia too, if it continues its economic growth, unless they turn Europe upside down, start a war, an attempt to completely change geopolitical realities in Europe. It's much too crude to say that that is the only reason for the war. But I would say it is the most important one, and it helps to explain how the war and its origins 
a link to much wider issues in 20th century history. Much of 20th century history of Europe and of the world is about empire. It's about the, you know, the, the international power of empires, but also their increasing vulnerability. And again, that comes back to the core of what's happening in 1914. It's on the one hand that you're not going to be a really big player in international affairs unless you have continental scale, in other words, empire. And yet at the same time that empire is becoming increasingly vulnerable to nationalism and democracy. And so you have these conflicting tensions and pressures centered, of course, on Europe at that time, which result in the catastrophe of 1914 and which have not entirely gone away in today's world. The, the, the problems are not quite the same, but they are very parallel. I mean, if you look at the present crisis in Europe, it's to do with the fact that the European Union exists in the end to pool the resources of the European continent so that Europeans will not be marginalized in the great questions which, you know, are going to face us in the future, already facing us now. And yet, on the other hand, of course, how do you square continental scale pooling the resources of a continent with the fact that Europe is the continent which created modern nationalism and hasn't in any sense overcome it? How do you create a legitimate continental scale government in Europe, given the reality that actually legitimacy largely lies with nations? in the eyes of their population. It's, it's the same fundamental issue that we had before 14. It hasn't gone away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Obviously, they were competing uh, for territory and, as you say, uh, influence in the vast, uh, broader territory of the Europe. And I guess Ukraine at that time was a determining factor, uh, at least, at, uh, or played a central role for Russia, at least. That is not the but, case anymore. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the basic point before 1914 is that Ukraine is the center of the Russian Empire's heavy industry, metallurgical industry, coal, iron, etc. The real sinews of power. It's also the, the key to Russian agricultural exports. You've got to remember that in 1913, Russia is competing with the United States to be the world's greatest exporter of grain. And therefore, on its exports of grain depend the empire's balance of trade, its balance of payments, its entire strategy of economic modernization. In other words, take away Ukraine and Russia ceases to be a great power. If Russia ceases to be a great power, then there's only one truly great power left in Europe, it's Germany. That is why what happens to Ukraine is so absolutely crucial then. As I tried to say in the book, it's not that the Ukrainian issue is the main cause of the war, it's becoming more important, but it's not, in 1914, the main issue by any manner of means. But when the Russian Empire collapses in 1917, and Ukraine is able to emerge in principle as an independent state, but actually as a German satellite, that gives Germany its best opportunity to dominate Europe and win the First World War, which indeed it would have done had not the Rev Russian Revolution been followed immediately by American intervention in the war and the defeat of Germany. That's why Ukraine is so crucial. What, of course, is dangerous is to draw contemporary parallels, because the truth of the matter is now, unlike at the beginning of the 20th century, Ukraine is not the center of European geopolitics, and Europe is not the center of the world. And, uh, you know, to, to make a snooty comment, the core of the Ukrainian coal mining industry, which was the, you know, the core of the Ukrainian economy in those days, um, it was actually owned by my grandfather and great-grandfather by a series of accidents. That made us the equivalent of contemporary oil shakes. Nowadays, these areas are a completely devastated um, rust belt, uh, worse than, I don't know where, in the United States, Detroit, and completely useless to anyone. In other words, the war which is going on now in eastern Ukraine, which might, in some sense, hand over eastern Ukraine to Russia, no longer has anything like the significance that it would have done a hundred years ago for the very simple reason that one is no longer looking at the geopolitical core of Europe in many ways, uh, but one is looking at a useless rust belt. That's why you have to be very, very careful in making these kind of historical parallels. Very well said. Germany, uh, unlike Britain and Spain and France, did not have a territory. Like, obviously, you know, England had Hong Kong and India and uh, many parts of Caribbean and so on. And then Spain also had the whole of South America. And so did Portugal, had Brazil. And France, of course, had many parts of uh, Vietnam and Africa. 
But Germany never really went out in building territory outside of its near, nearby neighborhood. Was there a reason for it? Well, there's a very simple reason. I thought there were two. The first is that Germany is only united as a state in 1871. Before that, it's divided into many smaller states which had no chance of competing for emperor outside Europe, really. But the second and more fundamental point is um, geography. It's far easier for the peripheral countries in Europe to expand outside Europe. That means the British above all, but the Spanish too. To a lesser extent, the French and Portuguese at one end of Europe and the Russians at the other. Simply because of their geographical position, not merely the Germans, but the, you know, the old Habsburg Empire, and if you like, the Holy Roman Empire, are always going to be far worse placed to expand outside Europe simply because they're in the middle of it. They don't have the same access to the oceans or to the Eurasian steppe that the British have and the, and the Spanish have at one end and the Russians have at the other. Uh, and that, again, is a fundamental geopolitical reality about Europe, that uh, it's no coincidence that the great European empires outside Europe are f you know, founded by the European countries of the periphery. It's also no coincidence that um, it's much easier to create empires outside Europe than it is within Europe. Outside Europe, you know, you bring to bear the power of what were in those days the most developed military, fiscal and economic systems in the world. Inside you, and you bring them to bear against societies, cultures which can't generate that kind of power. Inside Europe, if you're trying to create an empire inside Europe as Napoleon was, as, you know, the Germans were in the First World War, or as Hitler was, you're up against rival European powers at the same level. Uh, not just of technology and economic development, but also of state structure and military power. So it's just far more difficult. And it's not at all a coincidence that, you know, three times in the last 150, 200 years, there have been attempts to create empire inside Europe by Napoleon, by William I, and then by Hitler, and they've all failed. It didn't mean that they were bound to fail. The Germans in the First World War came quite close to succeeding, potentially. But it was certainly much more difficult to create an empire inside Europe than it was to create a European empire outside Europe. Uh, and that, of course, you know, is hugely important for the history of Europe and the world in the last two, three hundred years. Switching back to Russia, Russia is, uh, has a vast landmass that spans almost 11 time zones and has a lot of natural resources. What it was like uh, if at that time Russia as the making of a powerhouse? I mean, industrially, economically, uh, inner workings between the government and the elite mm. aristocrats. Sure. What were the ambitions? What were they trying to achieve? The basic dilemma, contradiction, whatever you want to call it for Russia, is that because the you know, Industrial Revolution moves from west to east in Europe, Russia in 1900 is basically backward by the standards of Germany, let alone England. Um, and is very conscious of being backward, and there are both material consequences of that and psychological consequences in terms of the way that Russians think about the successes or failures of their own government. Self-doubt, all sorts of things as a result of backwardness, but on the other hand, they have a sense in many cases that the future belongs to them, because as the Industrial Revolution moves from west to east, and as this huge landmass and all its resources and its colossal population uh, really become modern, it will become overwhelmingly powerful and therefore that the future will belong to it. So you have this curious combination of present backwardness and insecurity and a sense that the future belongs to us. And that, you know, is very relevant, um, both to the policies that the Russian government pursues, but also to some of the underlying tensions in Russian society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The underlying tensions, as they call it, but did Russia or Russian elite knew, or was there a, at least a consensus about the Russians, Russia's national interest at that time, or it was still debated? No, there wasn't a consensus. You know, there seldom is a complete consensus in any society. Mm -hmm. um, but there was less of a one in Russia um, for all sorts of reasons. Russia's future is also inevitably. Uh, linked to different ideas about Russian identity. Who are we? Where do we belong in the world? What is our role in history? Are we Europeans? Are we fundamentally part of European society? If so, um, you know, fundamentally, we need to follow the same path as the rest of Europe. We need to evolve towards liberal 
capitalism, liberal democracy. All right, we may have our own peculiarities. It may take longer, etc. But fundamentally, this is the path we must take. Or on the contrary, as the Slavophil said, are we something unique? Uh, is Russia a unique society blended of orthodoxy and Byzantine traditions, Slav peculiarities? Must it therefore evolve in its own specific way with its own political developments? Must it, must it seek instead to be the head of some greater Slav and orthodox world? And then again, just emerging but becoming a little bit influential before 1914 and much more subsequently, are we something somewhat different again, a Eurasian society, a strange melange of European and steppe Eurasian traditions to some extent inherited from the world of Genghis Khan and the Mongols, etc., etc., etc. And that leads into ideas of, you know, our future being in Asia, our future being in the development of Siberia, or our future lying on the coast of the Pacific. I mean, none of these different ways of looking at things are clear cut. All of them merge into each other. Many Russians combine, you know, a sense of belonging to all these worlds to different degrees in different ways. But each of these polarities, if you might put it that way, about Russian identity has a certain logic in terms of Russian foreign policy, Russian domestic development. Uh, and one of the things I tried to do in my book was to go beneath. Um, the very important, you know, diplomatic and military policies, but d d beneath them to try and understand the ways in which they were linked to conceptions of Russian identity and Russia's place in history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you had access, uh, and you've done an enormous amount of research in finding uh, or, or connecting the dots uh, through the various letters and reports and archives that you have been able to access them. What are the certain things you discovered that, that may break the typical myths that or misconceptions that may exist out there? I mean, I think in terms of archives and sources, the basic point you have to remember is that in the Soviet era, although some archives were open to Western researchers, and I myself, you know, wrote my thesis on the basis of extensive work in archives and another book as well. The archives which were open to Westerners were the archives of the domestic regime. They were not the archives of the foreign ministry, the military, the naval, let alone the intelligence department. All of these were closed to foreigners. They were not always easily accessible even to Russians. And in any event, Soviet Russians were constrained in what they could say and write, even if they were allowed to see things. So the great difference since 1991 was that I did have the run of the diplomatic, military, naval, and there's not a separate intelligence archive, but some of those documents were there as well. And that does allow you to say and understand a, a number of things on some very important aspects of Russian policy. Less really in terms of ways in which policy is linked to deeper issues of identity, those you can usually discover, not always, but usually, in published and printed and you know, more generally accessible work. But if you're actually looking at planning and policy, both on the diplomatic and the military side, then the new archival sources are absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. The Black Sea ports uh, were very critical for any power who wanted to continue to dominate in the region there. In the end, um, who gained the control and how important they turned out to be? I mean, the point about the Black Sea ports for Russia, or well, the most important factor there, is that it's through those ports that the bulk of Russian exports go. That means the overwhelming majority of Russian agricultural experts on which, uh, exports on which, as I say, the, the balance of trade and the whole strategy of economic development depend. But also, you know, you have to remember that the centers of Russian industry are, are Ukraine and southeast, southeastern European Russia. Um, and their exports, the iron, the coal, they go through the Black Sea ports as well. That means that for Russia, getting their exports from the Black Sea uh, and the Black Sea ports through the Straits at Constantinople and into the Mediterranean and out, out to the, the, the oceans is absolutely fundamental to the empire's security and prosperity. And that is why the Straits take on an importance for Russia, which is even greater than the Suez Canal for the British or Panama for the Americans. The basic point is that you know, 
if needs be, as indeed happened in the Second World War, the British can find an alternative route round, um, uh, Cape, you know, um, the Cape. Mm -hmm. uh, the Americans can, if necessary, do without Panama. There are alternative export routes, but the Russians simply have no alternative to the Straits. And that is why they take on this enormous importance for Russian planners. Over and above, of course, the fact that the Straits, unless they're held by Russia, allow foreign navies into the Black Sea and are a threat to Russian security um, in that sense. But it's the economic factor, and particularly the export factor, which is truly crucial. The, the making of the government at that time, uh, and continued for a long time even after the World War, was generally dominated by people who were connected with each other uh, through nobility. Uh, and they intermarry, they, they work with each other. Was that how the, most of the decisions were there, or the common men, or the business, or economic interest people were also involved in that decision making? Look, the ordinary Russian is not involved in the slightest. Um, except to the fact that those who make the decisions are aware of the danger of revolution and aware of the need that, you know, if it comes to a war, those who are going to fight in it in the Russian army, in principle, need to be motivated and see some cause for fighting. But fundamentally, the decisions, particularly the decisions about foreign and military policy, are ma made by a very, very, very narrow group. Now, look, that's true across the whole of Europe. You could say it's almost inherent in diplomatic and military policy. I mean, how many people were really decisive in taking America into the Iraq war? Very, very small group of people. Um, it, it's almost inherent in foreign policy that, you know, tiny groups decide. Though it's also usually the case that they decide within a context in which other institutions and broader public opinion matter. I mean, that was also to a significant extent true in Russia. The final decision, of course, is always taken by the emperor. Um, but he is, you know, constrained in all sorts of ways. And his chief military and diplomatic advisors are not actually a narrower group or a more interrelated group, really, than they are in any other European country or any other European great power, with the possible exception of France. I mean, it's no longer a political system dominated by the old aristocracy, except to a certain extent in the foreign ministry. Elsewhere, it's a broader senior official group, really, military and official group. Most of the people at the top are drawn, as again is the case in Europe, from the elites. But, uh, you know, not a, not a traditional, very narrow aristocratic elite, um, a more broad service elite drawn from the top 5% of the population. The common mis misperception that exists uh, in several, but not all, Western uh, media or discussions is that the Russian leaders at that time and even today continue to be sometimes self-serving or outright stupid, if that there is a word that is more appropriate for them. Were they really inferior in the quality or they were just dealing with much greater powers uh, uh, arrayed against them and they just simply just didn't have the resources and they should have realized but they still went ahead and took the risk? Look, the narrow ruling elite has its foolish people, as most do. If one was really going to say who, who as individuals were decisive in July 1914, probably not more than 10 people. Were the 10 Russian people who were decisive in taking Russia to war much stupider than their equivalents in Germany, Austria, England, France, Italy? No, I don't think so. They were facing enormously difficult problems in terms of governing their empire. Um, and they were, in some ways, constrained even more than was the case than their French or British equivalents. But really, that whole narrow elite which takes Europe to war is made up of always men, drawn from a very narrow social circle, not usually stupid within their own lights, on the contrary, usually relatively enlightened, um, au fait with you know, modern ideas about um, technology, power, politics, you name it, uh, but also united by a set of common assumptions and values, which certainly do encourage, um, in many ways, dangerous policies when it comes to foreign policy. I don't think the Russians are any different, really, in any fundamental respect in that sense. If you look at what drives the, you know, those who run Russian foreign policy in the Russian foreign ministry, 
their ideas about international security, balance of power, state interest, national honor, the importance of empire, very, very typical of Europe as a whole. There's not a fundamental difference. And they have a very similar broader culture. They all speak French. Um, they share most of the same assumptions of the European elite of that day. I mean, the ambassador in, in, in London even writes his reports in French. I mean, it's one world. Russia is not something separate, strange, or particularly bizarre in that sense, not in terms of those who run its diplomatic and military policy. There's always a struggle, uh, which is not an easy struggle, in maintaining the status quo or carrying out reforms. And I think Nicholas II was uh, probably facing that as well in a greater stress than any of the leaders, because Russia was overwhelmingly poor. Well, I mean, the point that, I mean, I'm not sure that the problems he's facing are worse than the problems that the, the rulers in Vienna are facing. The, the basic issues are that Russia, because it is on the eastern backward periphery of Europe, is poorer and therefore to an extent weaker than the Germans, to some extent the French or the English. It's also that because this is a huge multinational empire, it's facing all the dilemmas of empire, which are increasingly looming, you know, for rulers of empire before 1914. It's also that there is a really fundamental dilemma that on the one hand, you simply have got to liberalize. You cannot go on running this country as if, you know, you were living in the 18th century. 10, 15 percent of the population live in cities, but, you know, 15 percent of a population of 170 million. You're dealing with a massive European educated urban population, which simply can no longer be run by the old methods. Um, and therefore, there is, a, you know, a, an important logic towards liberalization. The problem is that 80 percent of the population live in an entirely different world. Um, either they're Russian peasants or they're non-Russian peasants and potential, you know, potential for nationalist or socialist revolutionary agitation. And Nicholas II is really faced with one group of advisers who tell him correctly that unless you liberalize, you're going to lose the allegiance of educated elite Russia and you simply cannot run the empire without their allegiance. And another group of advisers who say, fine, but actually you cannot run this backward society and certainly you cannot hold together this multinational empire um, by liberal, let alone liberal democratic means. And the, the problem is that both sets of advisers who are giving him contradictory advice are actually correct. And actually, again, you know, if you think of things in the big context, Russia is part of that backward periphery of Europe that I call the second Europe. You know, this is the Europe of Ireland and Spain and Portugal and Italy and the Balkans and of Russia. And Russia is actually towards the back of that group in terms of wealth. And if you look at the history of that world in the first half of the 20th century, it is very seldom comfortably liberal and democratic. You know, for the entire interwar period, most of that periphery is run by dictatorships, either of the left or the right. And then again, unlike most of this second world, as I call it, periphery, Russia is also a great multi-ethnic empire. Well, Europe's great multi-ethnic empires didn't actually survive the 20th century. All of them were faced with tremendous challenges. And actually, it didn't matter whether they tried to meet those challenges in a more liberal way like the English or a more authoritarian way like the Russians. They all collapsed. It's not necessarily to say they all had to collapse, but they all faced very difficult challenges. So you combine the problem of the challenges of Europe's backward periphery with the challenges of empire, and you can understand that it wasn't much fun to be a Russian Tsar. And that's not to excuse Nicholas II or to disguise the fact that in many ways he was an inadequate ruler. Um, but his problems were much more severe than your average, and the, the contradictions much more difficult than your average Western observer or historian um, is, is likely to accept. Switching back to the um, nuances and details in the book, uh, just to refresh for the audience, uh, you have a chapter uh, that says crisis follows the crisis those four years between 1909 and 1913. Mm. Um, would you kind of give us a quick overview of what was the initial crisis and how it escalated or snowballed into more crisis? Yeah, I mean, look, the most basic problem is in the Balkans, you know, with the decline and then seeming collapse, or actual collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the Balkans. 
because that brings up big issues, both of Russian identity, its role as leader of the Balkan Slavs and of the Orthodox world, and more importantly, of Russian core interests, particularly at the Straits. But it also does the same for the Austrian monarchy and therefore brings on a head-on collision between Russia and Austria. Again, you have to remember that, you know, in 1853-4, to the Russians go to war with the French and British and almost go to war with the Austrians um, over the issue of the seeming impending collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Well, actually, the Ottoman Empire is a damn sight closer to collapse by 1909 to 13. It does collapse in Europe. Um, and Austrian and Russian interests in the Balkans and at the Straits are far greater than those of the British and French in 1853 to 4. So it's not altogether surprising that if um, the seeming but actually uh, false uh, uh, collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the 1850s can bring on a, a major European war. Its actual collapse in Europe in 1909 to 13 brings a European war much closer. There are lots and lots and lots of extra things one can say, but that is fundamentally the issue. The whole status quo in southeastern Europe collapses. And as you know, had been predicted by now for a century, that collapse, it, it causes enormous worries, um, above all in Petersburg and Vienna, but elsewhere in Europe, because there are very, very great interests and very great questions of identity and internal politics involved for both empires. It was not easy for the Austrians either. In fact, it was possibly even harder for them than for the Russians. Mm -hmm. Switching back a little bit uh, to a different topic now, so much about the book and so much about the context, and let's talk a little bit about the author. Um, how did you get interested in history? What brought you to Russia <laughs> and its evolution, and then, of course, history, history of Russia? And just give us a little sure. understanding of it, please. Well, I suppose my colleagues would say, you know, that it's because my family is of partly Russian origin. You know, we lived in Russia before the revolution, were part of that old ruling elite of old Tsarist Russia. Having said that, you know, we were not brought up to think of ourselves as Russian. My mother was Irish and French, born in India. We didn't speak Russian at home. So it was a conscious choice. Um, and why one makes those kind of conscious choices are a sort of part of autobiography. I wouldn't even be able to give you a, a sure answer to that myself. I suppose the most obvious point is that I just became very, very fascinated by it. I've always been what most people in the profession would think of as a conservative historian in being interested in the history of international relations, the history of power. That's not been at all fashionable, even in Europe, um, let alone in the United States in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, but I've always thought of it as being very important. I think of um, foreign policy and international relations in the international context as being absolutely vital for Russian history. It seems to me that if one was going to choose one factor which was perhaps more important than any other in modern Russian history, it's the constant effort to emulate, to keep up with, to, to match, to defend yourself against, to out run Western society, uh, Russia's drive to be a, a great power, to be a superpower, to be a world leader, partly driven by ambition, partly by insecurity, with all sorts of connotations which go beyond the narrowly military and political to questions of identity and national confidence. All of this seems to me completely fundamental, and that's why it's always been not the only by any means, but one of the key things I've always studied. So for me, coming back to this, you know, for this last book, um, was a natural process, because after all, when I'd begun to study this, as I said earlier, the key archives were closed. Um, so for heaven's sake, this was a moment to come back and look at the, the question. There was also a narrower reason in the sense that the centenary of the origins of the First World War created great interest, particularly in Europe, more than in the United States in the origins of the war. Um, a number of very good books were written, a number of less good books were written. Russia was not well covered. To the extent it was covered, the book which made by far the most impact in among Western historians was uh, two books, really, by a man called Sean McMeekin, which, to my mind, though they had some virtues, had um, grossly simplified and in many ways distorted Russia's role in the crisis and therefore there was a double or triple reason to actually weigh in and try and use all these new materials to try and show both how important Russia was, how crucial it was, how you simply could not understand uh, the crisis and the breakdown of international relations in 1914 without Russia and yet at the same time also to try and explain Russian policy in ways which were 
actually not that dissimilar to policy of the other European great powers and to show as well, I mean, firstly to show how vital international relations were for Russia and how vital Russia was for international relations, but also to show that um, what drove Russian foreign policy and what drove the international crisis were part of a broader crisis which ran through much of the 20th century world, which to my mind, you know, although it was complex and of course and multifaceted, above all else boiled down to the crisis of empire. Um, and it seems to me that if one's going to choose one reason why the First World War happened, it was the crisis of empire. And that was a crisis um, which, as I say, lasted throughout the 20th century um, and is absolutely fundamental to understanding global history. So although the First World War wasn't inevitable, nor was it just some complete anomaly or accident, it was linked to broader processes. And I think Russian history is a very good way of illustrating that. In fact, a crucial one. Thank you. Um, this, I believe, is the sixth book you had, and uh, there have been five. I think it's others. the seventh, isn't it? It's the seventh book. Okay, no, I'm just checking. I'm not sure. I, I've become such an oldie, I've forgotten by now. <laughs> Are you researching any more topics or thinking to write other books? Or uh... Oh, yes. I mean, it is the case that um, I, I have some problems of eye and balance. I worked so hard in those Russian archives, you know, because the main archive was just about to close. And the second archive, I was only getting material in microfilm. I completely did my eyes in. So working in archives um, is not really on reading old manuscript. It didn't matter because I, I never intended my current book to be based on that. I'm simply writing a book about what it meant in history to be an emperor. So I'm everywhere from ancient China and ancient Persia to the 20th century. It's in a way looking at the psychology of power at its absolute highest, which is empire. Um, you know, empires are global power. They really matter, particularly the most important empires, which last for centuries and which are linked to the great religions and world civilizations. So in looking at emperors, you're looking at power at its apogee. You're looking at power as it is um, conceived and exercised through the prism of different religious, cultural and, of course, political systems. But you're looking very interestingly, at, crucially, at, at human beings and human beings you know, subject to the most extreme pressures. It's um, it's a bit like being a, a physicist or a, some kind of natural scientist who puts materials or whatever under extreme heat or extreme cold. You cannot conceive of a more extreme environment than to be born the heir to an empire. Uh, and looking at the ways in which these human beings do or don't cope with the problems of exercising power within, as I say, specific context, tells you something both universal and specific. Universal in the sense that human beings are human beings and power is power. Specific, because of course there are enormous differences between being a Persian empire, emperor sort of in the 4th century BC or 5th century BC, and being um, William II of Germany at the beginning of the 20th century. So that it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It's, uh, it, it completely rivets me. And it's a way of trying to tie together many of the things I studied over the course of an academic career. I'm at the moment, for instance, halfway through a 1,000-page book in French on King Louis XV of France in the 18th century, which is really very, very fascinating. Again, you're dealing at one level with the problems of being a human being. You're dealing with problems of exercising power. In one sense, you know, you can learn from reading books on uh, family firms, big family firms in the contemporary world, and reading books uh, by people who are experts on management studies. In the end, managing human beings is the core to running anything, and human beings are always difficult to manage, and certain characteristics of how you best or don't best manage them are universal. And yet, at the same time, you would be foolish to imagine that you manage Persian 4th century BC courtiers in the way that you can manage, let us say, 18th century French courtiers. There are differences in culture and expectations. So it's it, it's very, very fascinating for me, and I love it. As you mentioned, the, the, the big uh, ghost or 800-pound gorilla that was in the in the room but nobody wanted to talk about was was the rise of the United States just even before World War I, that was leading to this uh, fierce competition between Russia and Germany. The rise of the American uh, United States at that time, and continues to be even today, was the enormous focus on productivity and technological invention and innovation. 
why these powers did not decide to emulate that and and compete that way or uh, gain supremacy or influence that way rather than compete for the uh, territory or physical landmass well they did i mean they put a tremendous emphasis on um, boosting their economies and developing their technologies and that after all is the key for you know russian strategies of economic development Mm-hmm. But, you know, American power is not just to do with high technology. I mean, w- when the Germans make the comparisons, and they often make very intelligent comparisons before 1914, you know, they, they say in many ways our technology is at least the equal to American. Um, our universities are better, but uh, they have enormous advantages in terms of this vast continental market. They have unlimited resources under their own control. And they are actually developing a technology and, you know, a a university related high technology, um, which is increasingly matching, if not overtaking ours. How can we um, compete with them? You have to remember that um, they don't take for granted the continuation of a free market liberal global economy. And in some ways, they're quite right not to do so. Um, you know, the United States grows on the basis of a protected, huge domestic market. No European country can match that. The Germans are terribly aware of that. That's where these ideas of Mittel Europa and creating some kind of closed economic block, which German industry can dominate. So it's not it's not stupidity, and it's not stupidity on the Russian side either. They're absolutely intensely concerned with the development of the economy, technology, etc. But of course, if you're the Russians, you're competing initially from a much weaker base in terms of public education, levels of culture, you know, all sorts of things. So it's it's a complicated issue. I mean, the fundamental geopolitical insight before 1914 um, that you're not going to count as a great power in the 20th century unless you have continental scale is correct. The most basic problem is that Europe is the last place on Earth where you can create countries of continental scale, um, simply because that Europe is the the traditional home of multipolarity and nationalism. And you know, we're there right now. The European Union is an attempt to pool the resources of Europe so that Europeans will not be marginalized in the great issues of this day. It faces the challenge of nationalism. Um, but the basic logic of geopolitics is there as well. Why do people talk about China and the United States as the world's only true true superpowers? actual or even potential, possibly India as the next one. It's because they have resources of a continental scale. But of course, they also face, if not quite the old dilemmas of empire against nationalism, the enormous problem of actually trying to govern these vastly various, hugely complicated, enormous societies. And if empires were always brutes to govern, um, because they were so vast and varied, at least in the old days, essentially, and you had to worry about the top 5% of the population. The rest were suppressed or run through patron client networks by elites. I mean, running the United States or China now in the era of mass politics, let alone democracy, is vastly complicated. So, you, you know, as I say, a lot of the fundamental geopolitical insights before 1914 were not wrong um, and are only too you know, realistic now when one looks at the competition between China and the United States. And that is an extra reason for writing the book and being frightened. You know, I live in East Asia half the time, um, simply for family reasons. And looking at the development of geopolitical competition in East Asia and the ways in which the internal political tensions, particularly in China, have an impact on foreign policy, looking at the ways in which the same fundamental you know, risks of um, brinkmanship, bargaining with threat of force always behind it. You know, all of that is pretty frightening. So I I don't think, you know, it's it's possible to say that these European leaders were fools. They understood the realities in many ways very well. And those realities are still very very much with us and could God, God help us destroy us. You know, if you look at the the realities of, of, of geopolitical competition in East and to some extent South Asia, then you look at the, the the structures of the states which really matter and the hugely complex and contradictory pressures on those who rule. And then you think of the future impact of global warming crises over, you know, water and all those kind of things. Actually, it's very frightening.
very frightening indeed. And there were moments when sitting in Tokyo and researching and writing about the origins of the First World War made your hair stand on it. That's one reason for writing the book. Mm -hmm. Switching the theatre a little bit from uh, Europe and Central Europe to East Asia and Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and South Asia. Do you see parallels? Do you see that humans are prone to repeat some of their historical past mistakes? Uh, as you were very well explaining, that the, there are a lot of similar par parallel things that you see between then and now. Uh, is, is China competing just with the U.S. or China is also competing internally to hold itself and not become the next Soviet Union that became just Russia? Sure. Well, I mean, all these things, I think. In the first place, yes, you've got to some extent a parallel, you know, Germany rising before 1914, China rising now. Always the difficulties when you have rising powers seeking you know, perfectly legitimately to play a bigger role in world affairs, to some extent mold dominant world values to their own cultures and tradition. In many ways, more complicated now, much easier in principle to integrate Protestant European Germany into an Anglo-American dominated system than to integrate China, you know, Asian, communist, all, all these kind of things. Some parallels between China and Imperial Russia. You know, countries which feel in a sense, or leaderships which feel the future is on their side, so long as they continue to grow, but at the same time are well aware that growing modernization carries with it great domestic political risks to their regime. Then you have, you know, the parallels with Imperial Germany domestically, I think, in China. You have the difficulties of regimes which to some extent legitimize themselves through nationalism and license nationalists and then find it rather difficult to control them. It was rather interesting, you know, when these so-called Senkaku Islands, as the Japanese call them, were invaded by a little group of Chinese nationalists. Some of these were Chinese nationalists from Taiwan, some were Chinese nationalists from Hong Kong, who were holding Taiwanese flags and thought that the regime in Beijing was much too soft as distinct you know, in terms of pushing Chinese nationalist agendas. Then you have the broader issues of international relations. One of the key issues before 1914 is that technology is making areas of the world which were previously useless um, now potentially useful and subject to geopolitical competition. That's above all the railway, deep mining, etc. Now you have the technology of the seabed. You know, huge possibilities, um, so we're told, of exploiting the seabed, which makes in a sense rational, these Chinese efforts to control the seabed in, south, in the South and East China Sea. And of course, potentially in the future in the, in the Arctic as well. But then you have the more fundamental problems of international relations and of empire. Partly it's to do with the fact that to matter, you have to be really a huge scale country. To be a huge scale country in the modern world is to be an unbelievably difficult country to govern. And that's true of the United States and it's true of China. You know, pity the poor man who has to govern the United States with all the conflicting pressures um, and the, the very great difficulties of achieving any kind of consensus. The constant public scrutiny. The fact that the United States, after all, was created, its constitution was created on the principles of Whig 18th century English ideas about minimal government. The United States and its constitution was created precisely in order not to be a great power. Trying to, to govern the United States as a superpower in the 21st century with a constitution which was designed specifically to stop that being possible, with a population which is deeply united, in which you've got, you know, whoever is in power in, in the White House faces an opposition party which will exploit anything to undermine him, um, and is not, I think, seriously constrained any longer by any idea of common patriotic sentiment. Well, I mean, that doesn't make governing the United States easy. Governing China is even harder, much harder. You know, and yet it's these two countries, nose to nose, potentially in East Asia, whose rulers could blow up the planet. Because in the end, they are still conducting the same kind of international great power politics that existed before 1914, almost necessarily. You know, you're dealing with independent great powers whose interests are seen to clash, um, who are deeply conscious of conflicting interests, but also ideas of security and who in the last resort are pursuing policies of power backed by the threat of force. There's always the risk at that point that things can go wrong. There's always the risk of brinkmanship. There's always the risk that 
both sides will think that the other will back down or that the leaderships on both sides feel that their own survival depends on not being defeated in you know various kind of competitions for prestige um, in international relations that's you know a very very dangerous world even before you begin invoking the possible sort of very bad consequences of global warming uh you know crises over for instance rivers and water not just in east asia but in southeast asia and south asia so yes i mean some things are different to before 1914 but other things are not and the fundamental dangers are still very much there we have been speaking with Dominic Lieben, the author of the book, The End of Tsarist Russia, The March to World War I and Revolution. Thank you very much to give us an opportunity to talk to you and hear your comments. And we will certainly look forward to talk to you more when you have a new or additional books coming up. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.